environment community, but he, but he does do only environments. Alberto uh, graduated from Politecnico di Milano in 2000, and as the history goes, the connection between him and our department uh, is even deeper, because in 1999, when he was a PhD student, he took a class from Professor Stolarski on fine So in some sense, he's affiliated with the department. In any case, after graduation, after obtaining his PhD, Professor Salvatori uh, got a position at the University of Brescia, where he's currently an associate professor. Uh, he, from January, he would also have a part-time appointment at the University of Notre Dame, so uh, you might see him more often. Uh, his research interest, uh, no, not only in a boundary uh, element method, as I mentioned, but in more general area of fracture mechanics. Uh, and uh, what is interesting, the latest uh, uh, development include what is called mechanical consequences of diffusion of, sp of species in solids. So it would be interesting. With that, I will not take any more time and uh, give uh, speaker Well, thank you uh, very much for this introduction. Thank you for coming. First word that I'd love to say is to express Sonia my highest gratitude to have organized all the th these things. I've been spoiled for days, and I really appreciate uh, being here. And uh, it would be wonderful to continue this cooperation as we, as we really hope. Uh, the talk of today is on my recent work on multiscale and multiphysics modeling of uh, lithium-ion batteries. And uh, although they do not compare here, it's a joint work with my PhD student, Davide Grazioli, who is in Brescia currently, and with Mark Gears from uh, the Technical University of Eindhoven, uh, with, with whom we have a, a deep cooperation in, in uh, multiscale modeling. So let me motivate this work. And to motivate, um, I'm showing you this uh, 2013 electric vehicles word report. The interesting number here is the total sale of um, electric vehicles, which is in this order. Uh, no, sorry, this order. And basically, this number has to be compared with this, which is the number of um, F series pickup Ford sold in the US. So the total number of electric vehicles sold in the world is about one fifth of the pickup trucks sold in the US. It's therefore evident that uh, electric vehicles need something more to be, um, to be something that the, the market desires to buy. And the something more is essentially batteries. This means the batteries I'm going to talk to are not the batteries that are currently powering my computer. There's not that much more to say on these kind of batteries. But are batteries which require high power high um, capacity. And they are generally required by the electric vehicles market and grid storage. These are the two main applications of batteries I'm going to talk about. So if we need uh, new batteries, then what, we mean, what do we mean with new? What, what should be new in batteries? Well, new might be materials, of course. We need materials that have higher capacity. But not necessarily these new batteries will be improved by materials. They might be improved by architectures 
or any kind of new ideas. And all these are frame are a good challenge for modeling and for simulation. So, if this is the um, motivation, what I'm going to talk today will be first why modeling, why multiscale and multiphysics in lithium-ion batteries. And second is not why, why, but what. What are we going to model in batteries? Third is why homogenization? What, what do we really gain from homogenization in batteries? And which kind of homogenization are we, are we going to perform? I will also uh, discuss with you a model validation. And, I reason, and the reason for this is that in order to perform homogenization, we had to write a completely new model with respect to the literature on batteries. And of course, this new model needs to be validated against real batteries. And finally, some conclusions. Okay, okay before entering the modeling and multiscale, let me try to explain in easy words how a battery works. And uh, if I'm a bit too naive, uh, I apologize since the beginning. But this picture, this is not a very nice picture, is not mine. I acknowledge this picture from Professor Bob Knee at the Colorado School of Mines, and uh, I, I thank him to allow me to use this picture. So, batteries are overall easy from outside. We plug some electrical load, and electrons flow from one electrode to another. And if you want to charge the battery, we do vice versa. We plug the battery into a, a, a charge machine and the electron flow the other way around. But what happens inside? Well, inside, inside, the reason why a battery stores energy is that because something moves from one place to another. Exactly in the same way we gain energy by going on a ladder or going up a stairs. The fact that something moves from one place to another is the way energy is stored. But what is moving from one place to another? Well, what is moving is ions, are ions, which, has, which are, as we are in lithium-ion battery, you expect that are lithium ions, right? So basically, lithium ions move from one electrode through the separator membrane towards another electrode. So electrons flow outside, and when they flow, for instance, from the anode towards the cathode outside, lithium ions are moving from the anode to the cathode inside, they meet the same electrode, it's not probably the same, but a friend of them, and they, and the lithium uh, reacts with the electrodes, it gets neutralized, and neutralized intercalates into the electrode. Let me say this again, no? it's quite important. So we have Lithium within one electrode. Electrons flow from one electrode externally. Ions move from one electrode through the separate membrane and the electrolyte towards the other electrode. There meets an electron, reacts, and neutral intercalates into the electrode. Okay? And of course, when it's charged or uncharged, it does the other way around, from one electrode to the other. Okay, this seems to be relatively easy overall. It's just movement of things. What makes the problem so complicated? Well, what makes the problem very complicated it, is that what it's actually moving is a charge. And when charge moves, 
and his charge are not electrons, but ions, they convey mass and charge. So what we need to model is the contemporary movement of mass and charge. That's very challenging. But this is not enough, because we know that within one electrode, let's say graphite, or pure lithium if you want, just consider a, a, a film of metallic lithium, their lithium is of course not in ionic form. It has to, uh, a chemical reaction has to happen so that lithium, neutral lithium is split in an electron and in a ionic contribution. So we have chemical reactions to take place. And a counter chemical reaction takes place before lithium intercalates into the active particle. So we don't just have to model the movement of charge and mass, we also have to include the chemical reaction that takes place. But this is not really enough because now the question you may ask is, what am I doing here? Why I'm here? I mean, I'm not electro an electrochemist guy. I'm from a mechanics of solids. What the hell mechanics of solids has to deal with that? Okay. To convince you that it has to deal with that, uh, let's see what happens when lithium intercalates in particle. So, in this movie, uh, that it's uh, supplemental material from this great paper, if you like reading this thing, this is a great paper to read. We will see a lithium, uh, an active particle, when lithium intercalates. This is the electrolyte where ions are moving. At the surface here, we will have the chemical reaction and we will see what happens to the particle will, when lithium intercalates. This is a silicon particle, by the way. Okay, we clearly see that something is happening here. And this is what happening to our poor particle due to intercalation. So basically, lithium enters the particle. The particle swells very much very much means 300 percent. This uh, expansion is constrained, constrained by the fact there are other particles around. The stresses grow up very much, the particle breaks. What's the problem if the particle breaks? It's a, not a big deal, right? I don't mind if they break too much, right? But the point is if they break, electron cannot flow through them anymore so there will be no more intercalation at all. So once the particle is broken, it's useless. And in fact, this has been noticed many, that by many um, researchers, because after a few cycles, the, capa the capacity of this high energy and high power battery, batteries fades. And it seems very likely that the fade, capacity fade is due to mechanical reasons. So this is one motivation for mechanics within lithium-ion batteries. So to summarize, movement of mass and charge, chemical reaction, stress analysis. And if we, go, we want to go farther, we have also failure uh, and then fracturing it. There's also more. Another interesting thing that happens can be seen in this uh, very recent uh, video. We see two different colors here that show up, green and red. These are um, so green and red identify particles where lithium intercalates. The red part is um, the particle in which there is no lithium. So to co just consider a pure silicon particle, lithium intercalates. There is a phase in which lithium and silicon coexist 
or a, a different phase. There's a part in which lithium simply did not diffuse yet. So it's clearly evident that there's a phase segregation uh, mechanism here. And uh, this phase segregation is what actually is um, driving, is controlling actually, the diffusion of lithium within particles. So if you want to be realistic, we have to conclude this phase segregation within our model. And this, of course, complicates the whole thing very much. So we have a very complex scenario. And what we are trying to do within this complex scenario is, in the long term, is modeling all these things. But what we are starting with is modeling the multiphysics and the multiscale nature of the scenario. And we did not yet consider two uh, involved models, mechanical models for the particle. So at the moment, we have just the multiphysics and multiscale picture. OK. Oh, by the way, uh, whatever question you want to ask, just feel free to ask. I'm not sure I can reply in a consistent way, but please ask. So uh, the movies and, and the idea I've shared so far bring us the issue of multiscale. Because the size of the active particle in which lithium intercalates is in the order of nanometers can be 50 to 100 nanometers, depends on the material. It can be microns, but very much depends on the material. But of course, the size of a cell within a battery is in the range of millimeters. And we know that the batteries are in the order of centimeters. So we are moving. So whatever is actually driven, the problem is in the size of nanometers. But the boundary conditions. So we, what we can really measure is in the order of centimeters. We can, we can measure the current, definitely not here. So ideally, we should make a finite element analysis of all this complex scenario at this scale up to centimeters. It's not doable, so which means we have to go multi-scale. We have to, to, to pick the right a uh, multi-scale scheme, but definitely multi-scale cannot be avoided. And the, the scales we are considering is just from particles to the cell. This is the range we are currently trying to model. But if we would be more realistic, intercalation is an atomistic phenomena. So we should get down to atomistics, what we have not done, honestly. It's already sufficiently complicated for us. So this is the multi-scale scenario. And, uh, and so I guess I put already on the table the two, the two issues, right? multi-scale and multi-physics. So what, what do we mean by multi-scale here? Well, it means we are providing boundary condition at the, at the scale at the cell level. And then we go inside up to the particle, and we try to model at this scale all the phenomena that I already described uh, from the multiphysics view. Okay? So we have, for instance, lithium ions that meet electrons, intercalate neutrally, segregate, and diffuse within the particles. We have electrons that go through. Uh, a networking in porous electrodes and reach the boundary where the chemical reaction takes place. We have counter ions because, of course, lithium ions and, and counter ions have to go together. But counter ions do not intercalate at all. So they come to the boundary and they stay there. And all this phenomena is what we are trying to describe. So what is the scheme that we want to use to describe all this thing? The scheme that we picked is so-called computational homogenization. 
I'll try to explain this also in uh, naive words, hopefully sufficiently clear. Uh, but please ask again if it's not clear enough. So we have a multiscale problem, which means we have differential equation at the larger scale, and we have differential equation at the micro scale. Okay, two sets of differential equations, each of which describes the multiphysics that we are uh, really want to describe. Okay. Now, in computational homogenization, however, we do not have any constitutive equation at the macroscopic scale. So we don't know the constitutive laws here. We only have balance laws. Whereas constitutive laws and balance laws, so the whole governing equations, are defined here at the micro scale. However, as I already said, the boundary conditions we don't have at the micro scale, generally speaking. Boundary conditions are, are at this largest scale. So what the computational homogenization does, and I'm sorry if I don't provide too much details here, is providing boundary conditions from the macro to the micro scale so that the micro scale can be solved. And once the micro scale has been solved, by averages theorems, the average uh, quantities like stresses or, of, or concentrations or mass fluxes are upscaled so that a neutron Raphson scheme can be built at the macro scale. It's not straightforward, but let me try this again. So macroscopically we write balance equations, but no constitutive equations. We can't solve the problem. But microscopically we have both. So we can write the governing equations of the problem. But we don't have boundary conditions. We can't solve the problem. So who provides boundary conditions to the micro scale? It's actually a transition of scales. It's called macro to micro. So that the boundary conditions at the micro scale are somehow obtained, derived from the macro scale problem. At this point, I can solve the micro scale. I know how to do that. Then, once the problem is solved, I can make averages at the micro scale. And by these averages, I can upload uh, the quantities that are required at the macro scale where constitutive equations have not been defined. So I can upload uh, all the averages that are required by a Newton Raphson scheme including also the tangent uh, quantities of the, con of the constitutive laws. That, that's the idea. Of course, the details are terribly complicated because of all this multiphysics that I've described. But the main idea of the computational homogenization is, the form, is what I've described. And this is an example of what we have done so far. It's not that much compared to the complexity of the problem, but it's still not easy to get here. So what is this? So what we see here in blue is the separator membrane between the two electrodes. Okay? Across the separator membrane, ions flow, either lithium ions or counter ions. Okay? So because of this uh, flux of ions, we will have a concentration profile that develops in time and also a, pot a difference of potential that arises, uh, an electric potential that arises, okay, that describes the migration. And uh, now that I will run this simulation, you will see different colors that actually depict the concentration profiles at this scale. If this would be an electrode, that something we still don't have, we are working on this, uh, what we would see is that um, ions would react here with electrons and 
neutral lithium would intercalate. But this is a separator membrane, so this is not going to happen here. Okay, so this has been, so the details I will show later, have been implemented in an in a abacus user element. And we will see here the, uh, the, formation, the concentration profile that develops, although the distribution is now achieved a, a steady state, the values are changing. So this is actually continuing. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not a steady state. OK, what I think is very interesting here is that the distribution of, uh, this is a lithium ion concentration, I would say. So the distribution of ions uh, near at particles is not something that can be easily predict a priori. Okay? So if we would love to model uh, just one single particle, and as we don't know the boundary condition across this particle, we would just take some axial symmetry, for instance, to make life easy, we will probably make a big mistake. There's no symmetry at all in real batteries. And this is something that can be captured only if we capture the real life of batteries within an RVE. Without that, it's, it's basically impossible. We, we make big assumptions that have no realistic basis. Right? Yes? So the white there is not yeah. Pardon? The white represents not I'm sorry, I was wondering about the, <coughs> the white in that image. Is that porosity or is that, are those solid particles? These are, uh, so this is uh, an electron membrane, which is, ba the electron membrane is basically um, a polymer, which is a sort of, uh, of porous material indeed. So this is a 2D picture, just, just think of a sponge in, in the third dimension, right? So this is a polymer, uh, and this is a fluid, a, a fluid uh, um, solvent in which ions flow. So ions cannot enter the polymer, so they, they just don't react with the polymer, so there's no intercalation at all. So in this case, it's just a flux of ions across the membrane. That's what we have been modeling. But in principle, a similar, let's say, path of reasoning can be taken also for the electrode, in which this is an, a an active particle in which ions would love to enter. Right? And, and, and in this sense, my comment on, on symmetries uh, applies. Okay. Yeah. The polymer is connected, except that this is a cut to the. Membrane. That's correct. This is a two D, but where the polymer is in reality three D. Yeah. Okay. So this is the general picture. Uh, before some equations, because we, we love equations at some point, we, they, I have to show up equations. But um, can, are we allowed to do this? Because when we say, when we talk about homogenization, we have to be sure that we can homogenize the problem. So that at least the principle of scale separation is, is respected, right? And in space, it's, it's quite, let's say, easy to acknowledge is because of the different sizes I've already mentioned. So we, we can accept that quite easily. But what about time? Because this is a time process, and we have to ask ourselves if the time scale at the two scales is, is the same or not, or, or whatever it is, right? Uh, in time, time scales do not separate. And I'll try to explain this why. Um, the point is that the diffusivity of neutral lithium within a particle, single particle, is way smaller than the diffusivity of ions within the, the solvent. Okay? Which means that the time required by ions to flow through the solvent across the whole electrode is basically the same that neutral, neutral lithium ions require to go through a single active particle. Okay? Which means that this, the, sa the same time scale required to model an RVE for the neutral, neutral lithium to go into the particle 
to diffuse totally into the particle is the same that I have at the macro scale where I'm modeling the whole electrode. So that's why time scale do not separate. So we need to model this concurrently, which is good news in the sense that we save some uh, efforts to, uh, to make scale transitions in time, which is not a trivial task to, deal, to be dealt with. But what I've just commented now means also that at the micro scale, time-dependent phenomena have to be described. It's not like, for instance, in thermal problems, which normally at the micro scale, everything happens so fast that you can say, well, at the micro scale, everything is time-independent. No. Here, you need to model time dependency also at the micro scale. Okay. So, this was about modeling at the uh, multi scale. So, I'll go a bit faster now because um, otherwise I run out of time. So, what do we want to model in, in lithium ion batteries? Okay, let me. Okay. Let's go with, with, with this. So, the processes we want to describe are very many. Intercollection, intercollection reactions. We have ions that meet electrons, neutralize, and intercalate. This is a chemical reaction. We have diffusion. And we, when we say diffusion, we mean diffusion of um, ions in the solvent, in the electrolyte, diffusion of neutral lithium in the particle two kinds of diffusion, and they are very different. We have migration. Every time a charge moves, it provides an electric field, and this influences the movement of charges as well. Phase segregation, and of course the mechanics that I already described. And we have the conduction of electrons within the electrode, because the, the, the phenomenon of conduction of electrodes is very different from from the one of ions, there is no diffusion essentially. We can say something like that. So, lots of that. Okay, so, let's see if I can skip something, but I'm afraid to run a bit out of time here. Um, Let me concentrate on the migration effect. Yeah. Let, let's go together across this. So consider the electrolyte, so the movie that I've just shown. Okay. So we have two ions, lithium ions and the negative ion, right? because it's a salt. So it li, Lix, Li becomes Le plus and moves. We have X minus just moves it the other way around, okay? Two ions that move. Okay. So which are the knowns that drive the problem? Are the concentration of ions and the electric field, or the electric potential, if you want. So three unknowns, okay? And which are the equations that we have to solve to describe these three unknowns field? Well, for the concentration, is the mass balance, standard mass balance, nothing else. And what about the other equation that we would love to use for the electric potential. Well, in principle, we should use Maxwell equations. That's what we have to use. And we are using them, Maxwell equations. But this is not what is generally done by the electrochemical community. The equation that they generally use is the so-called electroneutrality. So what basically happens in the solution is that the concentration of the two ions, plus and minus, is basically the same. Basically the same. Because in order to move those two charges, a huge electric field should be done. And this is not going to happen. So the difference in concentration is really small. And then what is generally done is Rather than using Maxwell equation, we just use electron neutrality. We just state that the concentrations are the same. Uh, this is plus one 
for lithium minus 1 for x, so concentrations are the same. We did not do that. Why? Well, well, first because we are a bit original, perhaps. But there's a crucial point. If we use electron neutrality, we are not respecting Maxwell equations. And what comes out is a big paradox of having an electric field in absence of charges. Okay? Because if the concentration of the two ions is the same, there is no charge. And if there is no charge, there should be no electric field. On the contrary, in batteries, it's well known that there is an electric field. So it's an electric field that does not satisfy Maxwell equation. This doesn't sound that nice. But this is not the main reason, indeed. The main reason is uh, that if we apply this equation in place of Maxwell law, we have no uh, way to describe the energetic interaction due to migration. Because the energetic interaction due to migration comes from the Maxwell equation description, not from the electron neutrality. And why are we so interested in the energetic description? Because to go from one scale to another, in order to upscale the quantities, as I've shown before and discussed before, we need to conserve energy at the two scales. This is the basically idea of the hill mandel condition. Hmm? So we want that the power that we are considering at the micro scale to be the same at the macro scale. We want to conserve energies between the scale. But if we don't have the energy of migration, we can't conserve that energy. There's no way to do that. So we had to model migration explicitly by means of uh, Maxwell equation rather than electron neutrality. But the consequences of this, and let me skip all these details and return to the general picture, if, if we, uh, so the consequence of this description is that we are writing a new model essentially, so we need to validate it. But we don't know if this new model is really capable to describe uh, uh, well-known results or, or experimental evidences in batteries. So that's why we need 1D, uh, 1D modeling. Okay? Okay. Uh, I think I'll have 10 more minutes. Am I, am I right? Okay. okay. In the last 10 more minutes, I will, so I will not go in through the 1D validation, but at least I wanted you to know why we needed that. Huh? The last... Uh, 10 minutes I will dedicate to answer this question. So what do we really gain from homogenization? Hmm? And um, Okay. So what do we gain from homogenization? So remember how a battery works, okay? We have lithium ions that flow in the electrolyte, reacts with electrons, and neutral lithium flows into the particles, okay? And eventually fracture the whole particle. That's the way battery works. That's the way energy is stored, okay? This process happens to take place at interfaces between the electrolyte and the particles, right there. Not anywhere else at there. But these interfaces are described only at the micro scale. Macroscopically, we don't see any interface. It's a standard continuum. Okay? So if we want to model realistically the storage of lithium, we have to upscale what takes place at the interface in something which, which can be modeled in a continuum framework macroscopically. Okay? And this is 
the main point in in, that we gain in homogenization. Okay? So we move from something that takes place at interfaces at the nanoscale and upload this towards a continuum description macroscopically. And the equations are here. So we have a balanced equation of lithium, which is standard time derivative plus the divergence of mass flux. And this is not homogeneous, but is equal of a source, which is the homogenized quantity that moves from the electrolyte to the electrode. And the same amount leaves the electrolyte to go to the electrode. So we have source terms macroscopically. And these source terms are the, the microscopic counterpart of the interface mechanisms at the microscale. At the microscale, on the contrary, we have homogeneous balance equations just because all the volumetric terms don't take, just don't take place, right? So this is a very standard balance because the intercalation is described locally at the interface as fluxes, not as source term. But if we made all this multi-scale thing correctly, what we really want is that this source term has to be related to the fluxes across the interface, right? Is this, is this clear, or shall I tell again? Well, we made all the scale transitions, and the nice thing is the source term, the volumetric source term, is nothing but the inter integral along the interface of the mass flux, exactly what we expect. It's what we expect, but it's not trivial to to obtain it on a mathematical basis. Okay. And of course, there are way more, um, way more, I'm uh, sorry, way more um, outcomes that we obtain from the, the homogenization, but uh, it's enough, I think, for today to point out the main, uh, the main point, which is the one I described. And of course, all the uh, mechanical homogenization takes place. We have a porous electrodes at the microscale and microscopically a continuum electrode. And of course, the homogenization is just the usual one for that kind of, of things. OK, uh, I've shown at the beginning, and uh, I go to the conclusion now, a video on f um, the flux of ions into the electrolytes. How did we obtain that video? So we had the one-dimensional macroscale, macroscopic problem with proper boundary conditions. And uh, we, we just picked one point, And this one point has been used for the RVE. This is a picture of a real membrane. Okay? We impose boundary conditions on that RVE that have been obtained by the macroscopic simulation. Okay. It's not yet a complete multi-scale approach. We're in the middle of the implementation. And by, and by imposing uh, this 1D uh, boundary condition through the scale, we obtain the um, videos that I've, I have shown at the beginning. So it's the one arrow down part of the homogenization. We're, what we are currently implementing is the other one the other arrow, the uh, average part. Hmm? And depending on how good my PhD student is, he will graduate or not, but I think at some point he has to. So. OK, let me just go to the conclusions then. OK. So I've shown you a very complex uh, system of equation that aims at uh, modeling a very complex problem. And, uh, and uh, I, I would say that we are trying to do in a, the most rigorous ways that we are capable of, of doing. Uh, currently, we are using finite elements for the implementation. And again, we are using a user element in Abacus. But 
a point that we should ask ourselves is which is the right tool for that. To give you an example, the number of fields that are available, available for um, implicit abacus is seven, and we are already at six. If we want to add any mechanical effect, we are running out of variables. So is abacus the right tool? That's a good question to ask, but if it's not, which is the right tool? And which is the right tool for what? Because if we want to model fracture propagation within a brittle material like active particle, is finite element really the right tool? Perhaps boundary element is more suitable. So which tool for which problem? It's not an easy ask a question to, to solve. Even worse is which data? Which data are available for us? It's not straightforward. Which is the mechanical property of an active particle of silicon? It, it's interesting. It, whoever group is, strong, is very strong in plasticity describes silicon as a plastic material. And whoever is very strong in fracture mechanics describes silicon as brittle material. It depends basically on the ability of the group, which is the, the material model of, of the particle. It, it's, not, it's not weird. But the point is, which are the real data that, that we have at our disposal? And even, even if the model I've shown is very sophisticated to us, there are phenomena that we, are not, that we have not described at all. Thermal effects, for instance. It's evident that the gradient of temperature in the whole process, but for us, everything was completely isotherm. And SEI, so the dendrites that, that form during these processes, we, we completely neglected that. So at the moment, we can't, we can't include that as well. So it's, ev it's even more complicated. And of course, mechanical failure, that I've said, as I've said at the beginning, we are currently not considering. So let me acknowledge, finally, the help of uh, several um, scientists we have the pleasure to work with. And again, uh, my students, uh, especially them who made, uh, together with me, the hard work. And of course, you that had the patience to get me so far and listen to me so far. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, we are open for questions. And as you know, everything is recorded, so you have to identify yourself. So I will come with the microphone. Uh, in order to use this scheme, with, which includes computational homogenization, you would have to know structure of the material at every point where you need to evaluate constitutive equations. So to what extent this is an advantage versus some, say, um, uh, uh, homogenization, which is not computational. You obtain some average properties uh, of the material based on some statistical, for instance, uh, information. That's a good question. So uh, it's, not, it's not easy to make just normal homogenization, though. The behavior is really nonlinear. Uh, Maxwell equations interact with concentration. And so the mass flux is not a linear function of uh, the gradient of, of the electric field. And then we enter in nonlinear no -linear homogenization. So we, it's, it's an extremely complicated. Uh, but it's, uh, it is also, it is also complicated to get the precise structure of the material at every point where you need to evaluate. That's the correct. At some point, we, we should have some uh, statistical analysis of the electrode. That, that's crystal clear. In this, you're perfectly right. How much information is available about the interaction of different these fields? I, some time ago, I was doing uh, two field problems. And that was complicated enough to get the information about how these fields should be interacting. And in my case, it was drying process. So I had to solve the diffusion problem combined with stress analysis. And essentially, very little information was available about the data that is needed to describe the problem properly. Okay. Um, we rely on data that are currently available in, in, the, in the electrochemistry literature. And uh, in terms of um, solutions, 
um, we generally have uh, so a solution of say, salt within a solvent. That's what the electrolyte is. And generally, we can't, so we are quite far from saturation. So uh, in the electrolyte, you generally don't consider energetic interaction, purely anthropic. But it's still not ideal solution because you run about 50 to 60 percent of the um, concentration limit, which means the effect of saturation is significant, but probably is still not so relevant to, for instance, have incomplete dissociation, for which you will have some chemical reaction even within the electrolyte that compensate for uh, excess of, of concentration or, or lack of, of, of concentration. So this seems to be well assessed in, in that community. And uh, so the, te the thermodynamics is basically of uh, um, solutions with no, no energetic interactions, but with saturation effects. And this is a very interesting point because you added one because you're stimulating me. So if we would not have the electric field, the effect of saturation would be zero. Right, the diffusivity is basically independent on the concentration if you don't have uh, energetic interaction. But even though the diffusivity is not changing, the electric part does change. So saturation impacts on the electric part, on the migration part, and impacts significantly in the order of 10, 20 percent on concentration. So neglecting it, I would not think it's a, it's a good way to proceed. Whereas, for instance, if you consider hydrogen embrittlement, in which there is no electric part, then you don't really feel any, any difference in, in, in considering uh, saturation because it, it does not impact on the diffusivity at all. Okay, more questions? So I'm trying to understand in terms of like the practical aspects of batteries in terms of rechargeability. So. The, the, you get the migration of the neutral lithium into the silica particle and the particle ruptures. So does that explain basically why batteries don't ever recharge the original capacity is, is the rupture of those silica particles and is there any way to avoid that from a practical operational standpoint or design standpoint or is that subject of future investigation? Okay. Uh, it, your question is very much related to what kind of material are we considering, okay? So if you have materials like silicon, which has a very high capacity, but it expand very, expands very much, the only way we have to avoid fracturing is to, is to uh, downsize, go to nano, very small particles, okay? And what we need to find is, which is the limit beyond which the uh, intercalation phenomena becomes a dramatic for the particle and, and, and fractures it. Okay? So the point is, which is the critical size of the nanoparticle. And the bad news is that the critical size depends on, on the rate. So the fastest we're charging or discharging, the, 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 the more amount of lithium intercalates and all this phase segregation and, and, um, um, and swelling change significantly. So. It's, it's not something we, so it's not a critical size that, that it's independent on, on the rate of charge, which means that applications for a taser, for instance, are very different than application for a CT car or, or for a Tesla motor. One expects that. And the second point is, um, which is the very intimate nature of the electrode? So is this correct that the electrode is charging linearly in space, like in the 1D modeling we are assuming? Or is it more correct that it's actually concentrating a lot on, on, on the layers close to the electrolyte and, and basically gets completely uncharged at the very end? This is microstructural effect. You can't model with a 1D microscopic model, right? So it, 
let's say, let's suppose the second one is is what happens. So that that everything happens in a very small layer between the electrode and the electrolyte. Then we can design new architectures, which much thinner electrolytes, but perhaps designed in a different way, so to exploit the characteristic of the microstructure in a perfect way. Of course, this is something I can't tell you now. We are very far away from these considerations. But the, the um, multiscale and multiphysics approach we are trying to build is at the very end trying to respond to the challenges I, I shown at the very beginning. New materials, new architectures, new ideas. That's Thank you very much, Albert. I think we used all the time, so we are now uh, conclude and uh, thank the speaker and proceed to the reception. Thank you.